but I will not really be focusing on the workings of it. By the way, this is a Gigatron computer, so I will not go into the very uh, nitty gritty details. There's existing talks that I did before that you can find on the internet. Uh, I will briefly discuss what it is, and then I will go into the process of making a kit to help people who might also be interested in making and selling then uh, their own electronics do-it-yourself kit. So it's about the lessons that we learned in the Gigatron project. By the way, is there anybody uh, who here has heard of the Gigatron? Uh, quite a few, not everybody. Who has a Gigatron to build it? Very good, very good. Um, so first, uh, a little bit about uh, the history, how it came about, a short introduction, and then I'll go into the whole kit making process. Actually, there's plenty of kits out there, and uh, Am I still audible? Yeah. They're fun to, uh, to make, they're fun to use, um, and for some people that's where it ends. I mean, you can, you can have enough fun just uh, getting such a kit, uh, building it, and uh, tinkering with it. It's perfectly fine. If that's satisfying enough for you, no problem. But uh, this talk will be about creating a new kit that didn't exist before. It all started a few years ago, in the end of 2016. Uh, not by me, but by Marcel van Kervink, a friend of mine, who sadly passed away two years ago. And he bought some TTL uh, ICs, chips, that you can see here, a soldering iron, an oscilloscope, and a big book about uh, discrete logic. And he thought, let's do a, uh, an interesting project. And I joined the project uh, six months later, uh, which I will explain further on. Marcel's first object objective was, well, really to, as a hacker, to learn and have fun with electronics. And he thought, well, let's build a CPU. So he had this bunch of 7400 series TTL chips, which are chips that are really basic building blocks like AND, OR, NOR stuff. And he said, well, let's, let's uh, build a CPU. And that's something that a lot of people have done already on the internet. There's a uh, CPU web ring that, where you can go to all the websites of the people making uh, such CPUs. So, and the goal was not to, to be useful or make really something that other people could use. It was just a, a learning project. And the inspiration throughout the project was, well, a very big inspiration was Ben Eater. Ben Eater has this wonderful series on YouTube about CPU design, and he uses breadboarding, and he, he builds a computer from, from the tiny beginnings to, to a whole 8-bit computer. He has created uh, this, this breadboard computer, and that was an inspiration. Also, it shows that you can actually do this. And, uh, and I will go into this in a little bit, uh, also the uh, Quark 85, which is a well, just an 80 tiny 85 that bit bangs a video signal out of it, a VGA signal, was also an inspiration and was a key factor in defining what the Gigatron was supposed to become. It started with uh, this system in uh, early 2019, and this is a 4 bit CPU. So, this was Marcel's first uh, attempt at building his own CPU. And um, there's a, a big chip on there, that's, a, that's an ALU, an algorithmic uh, logic unit, um, and a few other components, uh, but actually it, it failed kind of miserably. And um, after January 19 came this uh, Quark 85, and this inspired Marcel to think, hmm, uh, can I also do some VGA bit banging? That would be mighty interesting, because the idea at first was to make a simple CPU that could flash some lights or do tic-tac-toe. But this bit banging was interesting. So he built the thing on the top right, which is a system that with simple logic takes an image out of ROM and puts it out on VGA. So it's just like the Quark 85, but not using an 80 tiny, but using very simple electronics. And that worked. So that was the first step. And then uh, out of that, uh, uh, he proceeded to um, not use ROM, but use RAM because in the end you don't want to have a static image from ROM, you want to be able to change the image. So on the bottom right there were RAM chips which he had to load using uh, a microprocessor, uh, an external board that you can see on the web board as well. And then after a lot of work in uh, June 2017 there was the uh, 
yeah, the, the prototype of the Gigatron. So this was the first working breadboard version uh, uh, of the Gigatron, and that was the, the main proof of concept. What's interesting is that you can actually have a look at this project, because it's in the Home Computer Museum of Bart van der Acker. Um, and uh, so if you go to Helmond, you can uh, go around this uh, fabulous uh, computer museum, play with all the computers, and also have a look at this breadboard system that's over there. Which I'm quite proud of that it's, in a, it's an actual museum. Now, the Gigaton rules uh, that were made uh, during the process were we want to have a CPU that has no complex logic at all. It should be all really simple stuff, like stuff that you could buy in the 80s or 70s even. Um, so no ALU, this, this big hunking chip that does all kinds of arithmetic. No, it's not in the Gigatron. That's done with uh, s simpler components. It should be a single board computer with about 30, 40 chip count. And that was inspired by uh, Steve Wozniak. Steve Wozniak, his first job at Atari was to build a breakout, um, uh, no, sorry, there was a breakout game console, console, uh, arcade, and he was asked uh, by Steve Jobs to reduce the chip count. It was uh, like 100, and he was able to reduce it to, uh, I don't know, 30-something. In the end product, it was like 40 chips. And it was really a big achievement of uh, Steve Wozniak to, to make such an interesting system with such, little amount of, uh, such a small amount of chips. But we still wanted to do something useful and have a nice look and, and yeah, appeal to people. But if you want to build something uh, that's interesting, uh, as I said, you can just buy an existing project. And if you do it yourself, it, it would be nice if you build something that stands out, that you, that you make something unique. So that was also uh, uh, something that was, was in this kit. It, it needs to have something that others don't have. So find a niche. And by having this system which is actually a CPU combined video card, uh, makes, it, makes it a unique uh, system. A lesson in the process up to the prototype board was, uh, so make it niche, ma do something that others haven't done before. Of course, you build on the work of others, you stand on top of the other's uh, work, um, but find a niche, and also it helps to document. So Marcel started documenting this from the, the second board that you saw in the previous slide on hackaday.io, and that is really helpful because other people that might also be interested will uh, spark more motivation in you to, to go further. Okay, so that's about the, the, the prototyping stage. So that took quite a while. We had a prototype, and then um, uh, some people said, well, you know, that's interesting. Why don't you make this into a kit? Maybe other people are interested in this as well. And so that's what the main topic is of this. And it seemed to be a nice little bit of follow-up work to, yeah, to, to get this uh, as a kit. And we spoke to a few uh, kit builders that we knew uh, about what to, what to do, how to approach this. And um, they were quite helpful to us. And that's also the reason why I'm now telling you my lessons learned in the hope that you will benefit from what we have learned. Um, yeah, so this is the working prototype. Um, I think the work from the first buying the TTL chips to this stage was about 30% of the work. And from this stage to actually having kits that we could sell was about 70% of the work. So that's something that some people do overlook. They think, ah, oh, this is all nice, we have a prototype, we're ready. No, we are not even halfway. That doesn't mean that the rest of the process isn't fun, because it was quite interesting. Um, but it's not done, it's, it's quite a bit of work. So this was June 2017 prototype, and in February 2018 we had the complete kit that we could sell. So a PCB in a nice little box, all the components, a manual, controller, etc. Um, so this process of going from this to this was about, uh, well, Marcel and I, two people, we spent at least two days a week on this for uh, that amount of time. So you can imagine that's quite a bit of work. We settled on a way of working where we were being pragmatic. Let's not overthink it, but let's think about every step of the way to find quickly the best possible solution. For the kit, we wanted to be um, something that could still be a bit useful in today's world, um, but we tried to make it really retro and, and 70s. But we were pragmatic, so for instance, it has VGA output, which was not really an option in the 1970s. But uh, 
Uh, and for me, VJ is quite uh, normal because I'm a bit of an older, grumpy old hacker. But for people that live now, uh, VJ is already old school. So there was a nice uh, yeah, in the middle. And we also were pragmatic, for instance, in the usage of the uh, 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 chips that we used. So um, we wanted it to be 70s, where you would be using very uh, high power cons consuming chips that are also no longer to be found easily. And we settled for newer versions that are plug-in replacements, uh, but are, are using a lot less power. And another example is the, the power itself. The thing needs to be powered. In the 70s and 80s, you would have a big honking transformer on the unit. Uh, but we thought, well, this all runs on 5 volts, so why not use USB power? Or, or We also so thought about a, a mains adapter, but then you would have the problem of having different adapters for different parts of, of the world. And with the USB, it's much easier. But then there's still USB-C, USB-A, uh, micro-USB, mini-USB. And um, here we uh, thought, well, um, the USB, the micro USB can be obtained in a through hole soldering variant. So that's uh, this one. And the other ones that you would normally find on an end uh, uh, system are SMD soldering. SMD soldering is not that difficult, but I do remember for myself that the first time I did SMD soldering, I was a bit apprehensive. Hmm, this, this, might be, this could be hard. It's not that hard, but this could be an issue for potential buyers. Um, and we settled for the uh, uh, mini uh, USB. Another example, um, the prototype board has two chips, which are PROMs. So they contain, uh, well, the Gigatron works with 8-bit uh, uh, op uh, opcodes. And each one has an one 8-bit uh, data. Uh, 8 bits of data. And that's why there are two ROMs in the original Gigatron. And uh, we combine them into one. And you can buy uh, those 16-bit uh, PROMs. But uh, I grew up years ago when, when I opened up my computers, they would all have these nice EPROMs with a little glass inside where you could erase them with UV light. And I really like that idea. So uh, I wanted to get an EPROM in there. Of course, if people buy the Gigatron and want to use an EEPROM that you can electronically erase, it's a plug-in replacement. But we settled for this one. And also the clock I found in the prototyping board. Uh, there is a, a clock made out of, and I have to look because I always mix this up. This is a crystal oscillator. And this is actually a little unit that contains several components. And I know from the old computers, they always have a crystal resonator. And this makes it a bit more complicated. You need a few more extra components. But I think it really adds to the retro feel of the system. So that was changed as well in the final design. One of the very important lessons in creating a kit is to make things as simple as possible. This was also a goal in the whole Gigatron design process. Um, but also for the kit, it's very important because less Stuff in the kit means that it is less work to do for your packaging, less chances of errors in packaging and missing items. It's also less work for the people building the kit. And you will have a lower cost because you have less components. And we try to um, uh, do as much as we could in software instead of hardware, minimizing on the uh, complexity. And that worked quite well. It did mean we had to do some concessions. So in the, in, at first, Marcel was really keen on having really a super standout form factor for this box, uh, for this Gigatron. So uh, on the left, you see a really nice, interesting uh, uh, shape of, of interconnected PCBs. And Marcel was thinking about a setup like this. So something that really catches your eye. And, but of course, this is incredibly complex to make, uh, to design, and uh, also error prone for people trying to build this. And we spent a lot of time looking for the right uh, enclosure. Um, and we talked to, uh, to some people, also people from uh, my hometown of Eindhoven, of the Crypto Museum. And they had a, uh, a tip to go to people who make cigar boxes. In the Eindhoven region, there used to be a lot of cigar factories. There are still a few. And this, is, this comes from a cigar box factory. And yeah, it is a bit more dull. It's, it's, uh, it's a rectangular shape, uh, but it, it works well, and it still, I think, looks pretty classy. 
And the supplier was really helpful. He said, um, because we thought we, we need to have screws and hinges and stuff. And this guy was really super. He said, no, we can do this uh, like this. So we can put a bit of plexiglass in there and then it, it fits in there nicely and you can just close the lid and uh, or we'll put some wood in and it will fit without using any screws at all. We just need to uh, drill some holes in the back for the connectors. We also have some LEDs on top, but they do not need any holes because they, we have plexiglass on top. And it did mean that we decided not to have any buttons at all on the device because that would require additional drilling or, or anything else to, to make that work. So we changed the electronics, as you see on the top right, we added some electronics to make sure that the system will boot up nicely without having a reset button and the reset can be done in software. And then we needed a controller because that was not included in the kit and uh, we had no idea what to use. I found some controllers on the, uh, the internet in China somewhere and this is a Famicom controller, um, also known as a NES controller, uh, it's not completely the same. They come normally with a NES uh, a plug that you see on the left, but this plug, well, it's really hard to get uh, the connectors for them and they are hard to find, they're expensive. And, uh, but I did find a supplier who had those with a standard DB9 connector, which is very common and very easy to get. And so we decided upon that one. So we bought it in China, um, just bought a few, and we started experimenting how this thing worked. So we put it on an oscilloscope, and we found out that it's really a very simple uh, shift register. So you uh, give it a pulse, and then you, uh, to, to wake it up, then you give it a second pulse, and each pulse you get one bit of button data out of it. And that was really great because it allowed us to um, hook it up to the Gigatron actually without any additional hardware. Uh, why? Well, now I go into a little bit of technical detail. The Gigatron is outputting a bit banging VGA signal, and a VGA signal has a horizontal sync pulse at the end of every scan line. And then at the last line of the screen, it has a vertical sync pulse. And we use these to trigger the controller. So every, every vertical sync pulse, the controller is being read. And then every horizontal line, it reads one bit out of the button state of the controller. And for that, we just needed to add some extra wires and fix the rest in software, which was great. And also, since we were working on this, we could also um, add uh, LEDs with just one component extra plus the LEDs and audio out with uh, four extra components. Um, the next uh, big thing was um, to get this onto a PCB because we had the, uh, the, the prototyping board, uh, but of course we wanted to have a PCB. And this uh, required learning KiCad and um, getting all of this on there. And this is all, uh, uh, those traces are handmade. Uh, I mean, you can do some auto tracing, but this is all made by hand to make sure that it looks nice, but also that it is logical. So for instance, um, over here, you see the algorithmic logic unit, and you see there's four chips here on the outside and there as well, and those are 48 bits that it uses in the calculations, for instance. So this is logically arranged, but that took a lot of work. Um, it took 10 weeks of work to get this to the stage of this board. And in this process, we also um, had to know which, comp which actual components we would be using in the kit. Um, because, uh, yeah, you need to have the, right, the holes in the right place, obviously. And that's where we also uh, really tried to make sure that everything that you can put in the board uh, cannot be accidentally switched. So on the right you see two types of capacitors, and uh, they have different values, so they should not be intermixed. So we selected from the vendor uh, uh, different capacitors that have the pins in a different spacing. So you, it becomes harder to accidentally swap them out. So these things were taken into uh, account for the, uh, for the PCB. And we uh, made uh, uh, a few, and um, there were two mistakes still in there, which we caught before we hooked it up. Uh, we fixed those, and we turned it on, and it actually worked. And here you see it uh, showing a picture of itself as a prototype board. I have to say we were a bit lucky, because this computer ru runs at a very low uh, frequency at 6.25 megahertz and at that clock speed it's not really that important how the traces are laid out. If you work on high frequency systems that becomes really important. 
Um, but for this system, it's really tolerant to making all kinds of rookie mistakes in the uh, RF uh, field. So that was good. And lessons we had we, um, from the people that we talked to, from the other kit vendors, from the people that made PD, uh, PyDP and from the crypto museum, the Enigma, uh, was that we should minimize support effort because that takes up a lot of time. If you supply a kit and it's not really easy to build and people start asking questions, which of course they are uh, entitled to do, but that takes up a lot of, amount of, uh, a lot of time. And um, it's better to spend the time upfront to make sure that everything is, everybody will be able to build it in one go without any issues. So that means making everything unambiguous. So that's why we use the different components so they cannot be intermixed. Anticipate everything that somebody could, could, could do wrong. Um, and, and again, simplicity. So that was, that was a lot of work. In the end, uh, this prototype board, uh, if you have really good eyes, you can see this is version, already version uh, 1738. And a few versions later, we had the final board. And uh, here we did our best to make sure that everything is labeled as good as we can to avoid mistakes of people putting chips in the other way around, etc. Then I remember we also, Marcin and I, had a discussion about uh, sockets, and that was really a controversial uh, discu discussion. Uh, should we supply uh, chip sockets with the kit? So you solder in the socket, and then you put in the IC into the socket. And, well, you could say the, the pro is that it looks really neat. It looks uh, professional, like a high-quality product. And, of course, if you, make, uh, if you ruin an, uh, a chip, you can just easily replace it. So those are the pros. But it is more costly because you have to add them. Add them. Uh, and you also need several types, so you have the mixing up problem again. And there's a, lot of, uh, there's a high chance that people who are not accustomed to using those to uh, insert the ICs in the wrong way, bending pins, and sometimes they bend to the inside, and you put in the IC, and you don't see that the pin is bent. And it gives rise to all kinds of problems, so we were uh, fearing all the support calls for those. Uh, and also, the chip is, not, is there with a, 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 yeah, a physical connection, not a, a soldered connection. And that could also lead to issues, although maybe not very often. In the end, we settled that we needed a socket for the EEPROM, because you want to take it out and erase it and reprogram it. Now you have uh, ZIF sockets, zero insertion force sockets, that, are, that have a little lever to easily extract them, but they're really big and bulky, or they are not so bulky, but really expensive. And um, uh, we, in the end, we decided to use these uh, cheap du dual-leaf contact sockets. They are a bit lower quality, but they have a bit more tolerance for not putting in the chip at the exact right spot. It will still fit. It makes it easier to insert the chip. For the RAM socket, uh, well, we also put it in a socket to allow for further RAM upgrades. And here we use a more quality uh, turn socket. But we, it's, it's quite hard to put a chip into a 28-pin socket if you've never done that before. So you need to make sure that the pins are straight. So I decided to, to bend them and insert them in the socket for every kit. So the kit comes with a pre-inserted RAM into the socket. Um, yeah, the problem is well that if you, insert, if, you, if you now solder any of the other ICs into the board and you do it the wrong way around, uh, yeah, then you are really out of luck. You, it's, it, you can desolder a complete chip, but if you do not have the experience in doing so, you probably will ruin the complete PCB. And we've had cases of people doing so, and we uh, advised everybody who soldered them in the wrong way to just cut all the pins and then solder out the pins one by one, which is quite easy, and then uh, ask us for a new chip and put that one in. So that was the components, and then we uh, had to have a manual. So I spent about a man month on creating this manual. That was a lot of work, but it includes a little bit of information about electronics, how all the components work. It includes information about soldering, how do you solder. Um, and here you can see a picture of how you bend the ICs to make them fit into the board or in, the, in sockets. It has, yeah, so the soldering um, instructions. And uh, we also have it in a ring, so you can lay it flat, which makes it easier to have it open next to your, on, your, on your bench while you are soldering. So we thought about all these uh, things. 
And actually, this is after the wooden case that we supply with the kit. But this was the most expensive uh, part to make as well. Now, I don't know, is there anybody here who has uh, experience with a Heath kit, uh, do-it-yourself kits, by any chance? Anybody heard of those Heath kit, uh, kits? No, those were a bit thing of the past. As one person knows them, uh, a thing of the past. But they had really awesome uh, manuals, as you can see here. I, I looked up this image uh, after the fact, after I had written the manual, but you see this one also has uh, soldering tips. How, how do you solder? How do you recognize bad soldering? And uh, that's, that's really helpful because it saves a lot of work in, um, in fixing problems later if people make mistakes. So that led to this uh, uh, manual. And what also was really helpful is that we were doing this as a team. And uh, for instance, Marcel has a lot of experience in uh, software. I have less experience in software, um, but uh, I have more experience in soldering, uh, whereas Marcel didn't. And that really helps to, view other, to get other viewpoints. And for the soldering, for instance, Marcel told me that the first time he was soldering, he put in the IC on top of the PCB and also soldered on the top side. And I had not, I had not thought about people um, doing this because I had been soldering all my life and I know you solder on the, on the bottom side. But that's really useful information because now the manual can clearly uh, warn people for such mistakes that people will probably make. And actually, it's, it's, uh, quite a lot of kits were sold to people who did not have any prior soldering skills. And they were still able to create this kit. So that was, uh, that was really good. Oh yeah, and also, I'm used to, uh, I've been soldering and doing electronics for a long time. So I know the resistor color coding table uh, on the top of my head. But nowadays, people use SMD uh, resistors, and they just have the number on there. So they are not used to using the color. So we need to add the color codes. But I also made sure that in the steps where it describes how to actually put the components onto the board, that it does not only say you need to insert a 10K resistor, but also has the brown, the leg, et cetera, coding on there to make sure that people use the right um, uh, components. Because not everybody uh, likes to read, but uh, people nowadays normally will go to YouTube to find information on how to do stuff, uh, myself included. We thought, let's also make uh, a series of videos. So the kind people of, again, the Crypto Museum in Eindhoven uh, helped me out and provided me the space to uh, do some uh, soldering. And I made, a, a 13, uh, uh, I made 13 videos of the whole process going through the whole Gigatron build. Um, I checked yesterday and we're now at about 500 uh, views. I'm not sure if this, this is people who are just uh, like uh, somebody to solder stuff and tell, tell uh, people about it or if they are actually building a kit. Uh, but I think it was ni a nice addition. Then, sourcing parts. If you build a kit, you need to have the parts. And what's important that uh, in, uh, for your prototype, you just buy the parts and you're done. But if you, buy, uh, if you want to make a kit and sell it uh, for an extended period of time, you need to be, make sure that you are able to get those components for all of that time. So we looked around uh, to see what uh, kind of uh, people had these components and what their stock was. And we found out, well, the game controller, we had no idea how many there were in stock. So we took a bit of a gamble. Uh, the crystal was a bit of an issue, and there is one resistor network that might be an issue. Um, but that looked to be OK uh, for stock. And then also, we need the parts to be reliable. So we heard some really horror stories about uh, cheap uh, um, components being bought, uh, even I, uh, chips that were bought that turned out to be empty shells with pins. That, that does happen sometimes. So we went for uh, sources like Mauser, DigiKey, Farnell to be sure that we had the, the correct parts, except for three uh, components. The EEPROM um, is yeah, no longer really in production, I, I think, I assume. But we found a source that had a lot of them, and uh, they looked to be uh, new. I also did the swap test to see if the label was not uh, printed on later, but it, it looked to be a genuine part. And for this component, uh, it's not that critical because I need to program it anyway before it's being put in the kit so we know that it is working. Now, the controller, that was a bit of an issue because we ordered a few of them, we sold some kits, it worked fine, and then we uh, ordered our second batch, and then the controller was different. So there was different electronics inside. And to be technical, uh, one was, uh, uh, was activated by an up flank and the other with a downward flank. So we had to rewrite the software 
but we weren't able to make it work as smooth as the first controller. So all the people uh, here and on the stream that have bought uh, from uh, that uh, batch, uh, my apologies for the controller not being as smooth as it could have been. And we had some problems with uh, USB cables that were substandard, so they uh, had a huge voltage drop over them. And if the voltage drops, uh, the gigahertz one no longer works reliably. And uh, for the next batch, we switched to uh, AWG28, which is the measure of thickness of the copper inside of the cable, so thicker cables. And then all these problems were, uh, were gone, luckily. Now, the first batch was uh, 10 uh, systems that we gave to beta testers to get valuable feedback about things that we could still improve. And then we uh, had a, hundred, uh, uh, a batch of 100. And, of course, the advantage of buying in bulk is that you get bulk discounts. So they start at 25 or 50 or 100 or, or even more. So we thought, well, let's hope we can sell 100. Actually, our, our goal was to outsell the Apple One, which sold 200 back in the day. So we hoped we were going to make that. We had no idea if we were ever going to get there, but we thought we could take the risk of buying for 100 to, uh, to drop the cost. So let's talk about the cost. Um, if you build a kit uh, and you are going to sell it, you need to determine what the end user price will be. How do you do that? Is it the cost of the components? No, it's more. And this is something that I didn't know at the time, but I took it from the URL here at the bottom, and it says you take the cost of the stuff you bought for the kit, you do it times 1.66 uh, to get your uh, wholesale price, and then you do that again to get your uh, retail price. And that might seem like a lot, um, actually, we were, we were below that figure, uh, but we upped it uh, uh, substantially. But we, we need to pay taxes, we need to uh, pay income tax on what we, what we make. And what people uh, sometimes forget is the amount of work that has gone into building the kit. So we did get a few people saying, well, I can buy these components for uh, uh, 80 euros. Uh, why should I buy uh, double that amount? Well, that's because there's also a few many years, uh, or man, yeah, more than a many year in, a few, maybe two, into uh, design and then going from the design to the actual kit. And the process, uh, when we got the kit, it still cost time to package all the kits and ship them out. So that was about 0.2 FTE continuously for the time we sold those kits for two years. So that is also to be taken into account. And we need to reserve money for kits that uh, are being uh, returned or uh, get broken or lost or whatever. Um, so that, that figure is not uh, that strange. If you're going to make a kit, you will also need to realize that you need to do an upfront investment because you need to buy your stuff before you get your income from, from selling them. And it is nice to get a legal entity to make sure that everything is in order with your local laws. I would also advise to discuss the financial with the partners you're working with on the kit. First of all, I would uh, advise to, to work with a partner because it's more fun to do things in a, in, in a group, but also because you can learn from each other. Uh, that really worked well with Marcel and me. Uh, but also discuss the financials. Um, what if somebody uh, accidentally needs to stop with the project? which, well, unfortunately, Marcel uh, had to. Um, so it's good to make um, agreements up front uh, on what happens next. And also talk about the amount of work that each of the team puts into the kit and how you then uh, share the, uh, the earnings in a fair way. Now, I'd also like to talk a bit about kit packaging because that's quite a lot of work as well. Um, so. As I said, we made sure that all the components were different you, and not so easy to, uh, to mix up. So we could put all these standard components into a little anti-static uh, bag, and um, that's that. And I did that uh, using the rule, check everything twice. So I would make, uh, for each of the components that need to go into the bag, I made little piles of maybe 10 or 20 of these components. So I count, count them. Then I take the bag and put in all the components that need to go in there. And once all the bags are done, then there should be no components left. And if there is a resistor left, then I know that one of the bags will be missing a resistor, and I have a lot of work in finding out which one. And then I also needed to uh, count all the uh, ICs, the chips that go in there. So I used a, a piece of uh, anti-static foam uh, on which to put all the chips. 
Um, so I would open up a tube with the chip type A, put in the chips, then next one, next one. And this gives a really easy uh, visual uh, clue of whether the kit is complete or not. And again, uh, check them twice. Then the bag, the ICs, the PCB, all other stuff went into the little box. And again, I would make little piles, collect them, and check them, uh, check if all the piles were empty at the end. Um, yeah, this is a kit that came back after a round trip uh, over the world. So, um, some kits, I, I bought a kit last uh, few, few months ago, which was really nicely packaged. So, it was specially purpose-made foam with the indents where all the components went into, and that was really nice because if you shake it well, it still stays in place. This foam does hold the chips quite well, and in most cases, it will work quite well, but if it is really um, handled in a bad way by the uh, local uh, uh, postal office, this is what you get. But this was really incidental. So it was for us, it was good enough. And then in the end, the uh, box with the components, the manual and the controller were put in an uh, envelope. And again, we would do that twice. And if I were done, then forget to put a manual in one of the boxes and have one left at the end. Uh, yeah, it would be a bit harder because I would need to open all of the envelopes to see which one was missing. But of course, you can then uh, weigh all your envelopes to see which one is lighter, so you know where you forgot the manual. Now, we sold the kit for two years, and uh, we met our goal of selling more than 200. We actually sold over 1,000. And as I said, it cost about 0.2 FTE uh, during that time to do all the packaging of all the kits. And people have asked, uh, couldn't you find some cheap labor to do that for you? Well, we didn't actually trust others with that. I'm not sure if that is the right decision. Well, actually, I, I th my opinion is it, it was the right decision um, because if there's a mistake, the amount of work that it takes to solve that problem, uh, yeah, it, it, that's quite an investment in, in, in time. We've also got questions about pre-built kits. Um, can, we, can we provide them? And uh, the short answer is no. If you decide to build a kit, uh, it best is to sell them in kit form, because then a lot of rules and regulations do not apply. If you build a ready-built electronics device, you will need to have CE and FCC uh, markings on there, and that's a really costly, long, uh, laborious process. Um, in the middle, you see uh, a test I did with uh, uh, Mark Simons, who had a nice device to check uh, the RF emanations from the device, and it's horrible. So this will never pass any FCC test. And um, yeah, but selling as a kit, no problem with that at all. For shipping, uh, you can shop around for a good bulk uh, shipping uh, uh, person, uh, but there is no one size fits all. You will, in the end, have to deal with different shipping options. If people live in Manila, they cannot rely on the local post office. You will need to use DHL or FedEx or something else to be able to send over there. And um, um, insurance, we... Um, it yeah, would be nice, but we, we decided not to have insurance. In, in the beginning, we did have insurance, and then if your package gets lost, you can apply for the insurance, but then they will say, well, we'll only reimburse you the, the cost of the components in the kit, not the amount of money you sold it for, and please show me all the paperwork that explains uh, how much the components were worth. So it's a lot of hassle, and it's actually cheaper to just have these few parcels uh, be lost and uh, not pay for all this insurance. And uh, yeah, in the end, maybe uh, yeah, le a portion of a, of a, of a percent uh, had an issue. And some places are really hard to uh, send packages to, so there was one sent uh, to Brian in uh, the Falklands, and that one did never arrive, unfortunately. We also try to exceed customer expectations, so make something that people are really happy with, and they are get happy from getting something that is better than they expected to be getting. So that's why we may spend so much time on the manual, make it super, um, make the support better than expected, um, so they are happy with the, with the whole experience. And support we did via email, but we also try to do a lot of, of for people to do self-help. Uh, uh, so we had... Um, uh, a website on the internet with all kinds of guides, uh, how to measure voltages to, to pinpoint the problem. And quite early on, we, uh, we made a uh, forum. 
And um, we had very limited issues with the, with the parts that we got in, uh, only with the controller problem I told you about. And once, believe it or not, uh, we had a customer saying, uh, there were the wrong resistors in my package. Well, no worry, because I'm an electronics geek, so I have enough spare ones. Uh, and then somebody else said, uh, I'm also missing uh, resistors, and it turned out I, I had swapped them in the two different bags, and of course my little piles were all down to zero, so I didn't notice that I had swapped resistors in two packages. But that was the only mistake I made in, uh, in two years, so that's fine. Marketing we did a little bit. Uh, first of all, uh, we used a really nice uh, uh, white uh, uh, box to, to send them in to, to get that first experience of, ah, this is a nice kit. But of course, we also need to do some uh, uh, marketing via vloggers, and we decided to send a kit to um, um, the 8 bit guy uh, who has a blog about 8 bit uh, computing. And we already knew in advance that he would not like the fact that it would not run basic. Uh, actually, the current version does run basic, but the first version didn't. And uh, he also commented about it, but he had, did a really nice uh, review, and that video now has uh, almost 2.5 million uh, hits. So that was really great. And we also sent one to the EEV blog, which is an electronics uh, guy. And this was cool because he got the kit. And uh, he opened it up uh, on this channel. And he uh, saw the manual, said, that's nice, do it away. And then he just started, he saw on the, on the PCB what, it, what should be on there. And he just started soldering all the stuff on there without any manual at all. And he got it working from the first try. So that was really great. And he did a, a, he did a live uh, soldering session video. And he also did some follow-up videos about, uh, ah, this is a nice system to show you the difference between two-layer and four-layer PCBs. So uh, together with us, he made a four-layer PCB, and he did some measurements to see what the differences are. And he also did a video about the um, uh, caps that are there, uh, um, uh, well, with the bypass capacitors. So that was cool. And we sold... Uh, Quite a few. Uh, in the first month, uh, we sold to 25 countries. We sold to companies like uh, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook, uh, IBM. Well, we sold to Apple, but I don't think we sold to Steve Wozniak, which was our uh, super, super goal. We also created this community on, uh, uh, on, on forum.gigatron.io, and then it, it took off a little bit. And that was really great to see if you, if you have your your, your uh, brainchild come to life with people starting to use it and experiment themselves. And after one month, we had some, some additional software. Um, we had sprites. Uh, we had people doing hardware, like uh, RAM extensions. Um, we had uh, somebody who built a, uh, a really fast version using special fast TTL chips that would run at, uh, at quite a large speed. Uh, but of course, then the screen is reduced. We had uh, things like this, like a special uh, uh, breadboard, uh, sorry, breadboard PCB with everything um, uh, in, a, in a very small form factor with uh, more ROM and uh, four layer PCB. We had software like a C, C compiler. Uh, people are working on the fourth, fourth for the Gigatron. We have video repeaters. We have uh, all kinds of other stuff. And in the end, it's, 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 it's crazy what, what people have written. So on the right, yeah, that's actually coming from a system without a microprocessor with just uh, under uh, a 1,000 uh, logic gates doing the VGA as well. So that was cool. Now, issues, there weren't many. Uh, one issue we were worried about in the beginning was, what if somebody takes our idea and just clones the PCB? Um, copycats. And it was only uh, after one and a half years that we found on eBay this uh, Digatron from Russia. And uh, I was curious, uh, Marcel was furious, I was curious, I ordered one, I had a look, and this thing does not work at all. It is really not a working uh, copy, but it was interesting to see. And there were only maybe 10 sold, and that was it. So we didn't have, have any problems with that. We did expect that it would be a nice uh, kit for uh, educational institutes, but um, in fact, uh, yeah, we didn't sell, sell, well, we sold some to uh, universities and such, but not that many as we would have expected. Another issue that we had, there was one guy uh, who, uh, who in the beginning asked for schematics. He was also working on a, on a CPU for himself, uh, which we explained were in the manual. And then son suddenly he, be he became bad-mouthing us on all kinds of occasions. We just uh, ignored him. 
and so did the other people on the people on the internet so that was also uh, controllable now after two years uh, the project ended uh, at that time uh, Marcel was was terminally ill we uh, spoke about this project uh, he had actually plans to continue and maybe port uh, CPM to it and uh, do some other stuff and I said well actually you know um, it was really fun to create to make the design and also make the kit but you know putting resistors in little bags uh, for one day a week uh, yeah that's really work <laughs> that's not that's not hacking uh, so for me that the, the, the there was no not much fun in there well there's still fun in, in, in following the community and what, what people are building but not so much in yeah creating actual kits so everything was then open sourced you can find everything online and a few companies have started to sell kits as well uh, they don't have the manual which you can download from the internet and they don't have the nice little wooden box and some also do not inc include the controller but it is enough to get a working gigatron um, uh, so uh, important uh, lessons that we've learned is it really pays off to have a minimalistic design that makes it easier to uh, create the kit, it makes it cheaper, it makes it less error prone. Um, the problematic approach, um, we tried to have a set of rules to stick by, like making it a 70s, 80s error machine, but where needed we would deviate a little bit where we felt it was still right. And try to put a lot of effort not in support after you've sold the kits, but get that time spent uh, in advance to make sure that people do not need the support. Make sure that you have a team, because two know more than one, so that really helps in making the product better. And uh, we were lucky that we, um, in, the, in the beginning, uh, made sure that we were able to update the software later um, and uh, add uh, functionality to it. And of course, most important is to just have fun doing this. It's a really fun project. You learn a lot and uh, stop when it becomes work. And uh, the greatest achievement I think we've got is that in the end one was uh, sent to uh, Steve Wozniak. So I know he has one. Uh, he was uh, impressed by the uh, chip uh, account on the system. And he actually did sign uh, a Gigatron that I have here. So to infinity and beyond, thank you very much for your attention. And, uh, and maybe hold. I have 30 seconds for questions or... Yeah, go for it. You've got, uh, you've got two minutes. Cool. So, yeah, if there's any questions um, for Gigawalt, please uh, quickly head up to the microphones in the center um, and be brief. Yes, on the front microphone. Um, was A little closer, please. Was sending kits to these guys on YouTube really all the marketing you did? Like all the public relations, whatever you yeah, want to call it? The, what we did was, um, well, the, the most of the marketing was on hackaday.io. So that created already a bit of a buzz. And then the online marketing we did was only create a forum that we didn't advertise any further and the two YouTube videos. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Um, hi. Uh, on the question of uh, how to sourcing uh, to source parts, you mentioned an R to R resistor network. Yeah. Uh, if that was such a problem, wouldn't it have been easier to just use uh, discrete resistors there? Or yeah. So that was our backup plan. So we thought if the resistor network is no longer available, we'll just uh, get some resistors. And actually, uh, they have now become really hard to source. So one of the suppliers that is now selling Gigatron kits is using that approach. Okay. Thank you. So it was a good question. Uh, thank you. Can you tell something about how people program the Gigatron? Yeah, there are several ways to program it. We have a, uh, well, you can program it in machine language, but it's really hard because you have to keep track of all the timing to make sure that the VGA signal is still correct. So nobody does that. Then we have something called the uh, Gigatron con command language, GCL, that's um, uh, rather low level still, but good enough to be used to create some games or other, other things. And uh, now, of course, we also have uh, the, the little C compiler. We have uh, BASIC. Uh, so there are a few ways to, to program it. But, but do you need to refresh the EEPROM? Ah. Uh, yeah, so basically, you need to refresh the EEPROM. But there are now uh, hardware uh, extensions. So this is a hardware extension. 
that also includes an SD card where you can just in, uh, put your files on the SD card and run them from there. So that's not part of the original design, but something that came out of our community. Nice. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, I think all that remains is to join me in thanking Gigawalt for a fantastic talk. Thank you.